In the last few videos, we've seen how to organize caches, how to design a data array and a corresponding tag array. Now, before I wrap up this topic, I'm going to go through a few more properties of caches. So firstly, when you have a read miss, you bring a block in and you place it into cache. And this is based on the assumption that the block is going to exhibit both spatial and temporal locality. Now, if the processor was doing a write, let's say you were doing a store into memory and you didn't find the block in your cache, and you had to go and bring the block from memory. Now the question is, you know, do I place that block into cache or not? And one can make the argument that writes exhibit different levels of spatial and temporal locality. In fact, they have a little less locality because you can assume that the fact that I'm doing a write indicates that I'm done working on this data and I'm putting it away in memory, right? So if you assume that, then maybe you don't place this block into cache and that's referred to as a write no allocate policy. But over time, people have realized that even these blocks that were triggered by a write miss do turn out to be useful in the near future. And so most modern processors use what is called a write allocate policy, which means that writes are treated no differently from reads. So when you bring a block in, you're going to place it into the cache no matter what. Now, when you do bring that block into cache, the question is, where do I place it? Now, if you have a direct map cache, then every address maps to a unique set and that set contains a single block in the cache. So in this case, you really don't have a choice. When you bring a block in, you're going to stick it into this location here, and whatever used to sit here gets evicted out of the cache, right? So a direct map cache doesn't really give you any choice. If you assume a set associative cache, right? So here's a four-way set associative cache. Every address maps to a unique set, and in that set, you have four different blocks. Now you have some choices in, in terms of what you can evict to make room for this new block. A random policy obviously says that at random I evict some block and this new incoming block gets placed in that, in that particular way. A second option is to use a FIFO replacement policy, which is nothing but a round robin policy. So the first block that comes in gets placed in the first way. The next block that comes in gets placed in the second way, then in the third way, then in the fourth way then you rotate back to the start and use that first way again. Now, what is more commonly done in modern processes is something that's a little smarter, and that's referred to as the least recently used policy, or the LRU policy, which says that you're going to keep track of recent accesses to this particular set and to every set out there, and you're going to keep track of which ways in that set were touched most recently and least recently. So in this example with the four-way cache, I'm going to have a separate data structure over here that does some additional bookkeeping and which maybe keeps track of the fact that, you know, way number three was touched most recently. And prior to that, you know, maybe way number four was touched and then maybe way number two was touched next. And then the one that was touched least recently is way number one, right? So this is the most recently used way and this is the least recently used way. So when you have a cache miss and a block comes in, it's, this tells me that way number one, which is least recently used, is perhaps least useful and should be evicted to make room for the new block, right? So that's what comes in. And then you readjust this bookkeeping data structure to say that now the one that has touched most recently is way one. So this becomes number one. And then way number three, which used to be most recently used, is now the second most recently used way and then this becomes three and this becomes four. So the next time you have a cache miss, it is this block that is least recently used. And so the block in way two gets evicted to make room for the new block. Okay, so that's referred to as the LRU policy. And you can see that because of this bookkeeping data structures on the side, there's a little bit of overhead in terms of both storage and logic. And that overhead becomes a little non-trivial as you have a highly set associative cache. And so, so to reduce those overheads, what is commonly used is a policy referred to as pseudo LRU. So it tries to approximate the behavior of LRU without having those same overheads. Now let's look at writes again and see how those writes are handled. So there are two main policies. There's a write through policy and a write back policy. So let's say that you have an L1 cache and then there's a backup L2 cache and then beyond that is my main memory. So when the processor does a store, and if you have, let's say, an L1 cache hit, you're certainly going to modify the contents of that block in L1. And now the question is, do I also reflect those changes in my L2 and in my memory? 
So there's a copy of this block here. There's a copy of that block over here as well as over here. So when I change the contents of L1, if I choose to reflect those changes in all levels of the cache hierarchy, that's referred to as a write-through policy. The other option is to say that when I make a change, I'm only going to make a change to the L1 and the L2 and the memory copies start to get a little out of date. Eventually, when this block is evicted from the L1, I'm going to reflect those changes in the L2 and in memory. Right? So if I defer these updates to the L2 and memory, that's referred to as a write back policy. And most modern processors use a mix of both of these. Right? So very often you'll see a processor where the L1 and L2 hierarchy is write through. That means every change in L1 is also reflected in the L2. And very often you'll see the L2 memory hierarchy being write back, which says that it's only when the block gets evicted from L2 that I update the copy in memory. So the pros and cons are a write back policy is more frugal in terms of bandwidth. A write through policy is going to consume more bandwidth. But when you later build a cache coherent system, that is when you have multiple processors connected to the same memory, you'll later realize that it's easier to implement cache coherence if you have a write through policy, right? So if someone else wants a copy of the same block, it's easier to find and return a valid copy of the block if you know that the copy in L2 is always correct. Okay, so a write back is more frugal in terms of bandwidth and that's because it coalesces multiple writes to a given block into you know one single write into the next level. Whereas a write through policy ensures that you don't have to dig into the L1 if someone else makes a request for that same block.